Hi everybody, it's so nice to be in front of you. I haven't actually been around to, for one of these talks for a bit of a while, but it's nice to see some nice faces and um, hopefully in shul as well. So the whole, uh, this whole experience came about because I felt that Sarah had a story to tell and I wanted her, despite her um, difficulty <laughs> in verbalizing yes, her story, yes. it took a few glasses of red wine <laughs> to get her to come. Uh, and we pre-recorded this session um, in case she passed out with anxiety. <laughs> we could edit that bit out. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure whether I was going to be here this evening either. So she made it. So she came and had dinner with us and we filled her glass with yeah, red and wine. I've, and I've got a cat. And um, yeah. we're going to hear a little bit today about um, how Sarah has contributed to our community and other communities in all of the volunteer work that she's done over the years. So... Um, if you could take a seat, um, this takes I think about 40 minutes and then we're going to have questions and answers afterwards if, if, if that's okay. Hi Sarah, it's lovely to have you. Thank you for coming over to my place and having a chat. We're actually face to face on Zoom which is very unusual. And I've got my pussy And you've got, yeah, you've got my cat Lily, she's very famous. <laughs> Lily, hello Lily, hello Lily. <laughs> So today we're going to be delving into um, some of the amazing community work that you've been involved in. So I understand that you have given an enormous amount of time to the Jewish community. But we also don't do just Jewish. Right. I'm involved in the local community where the Jewish members of the committee organise. You notice the word Jewish. <laughs> members of the committee organise the carols by candlelight. <laughs> in Chiswick Gardens every year for the Queen Street and West Wallara Association. I think that's a fabulous thing. Well, you've got to ask the Jews. Do you want to get anything done? <laughs> that's exactly right. Yes. So maybe, Sarah, we can start by asking you a little bit about yourself. Can you give us like a broad picture of where you grew up, how you grew up, what your family life was like? Well, um, I'm a true Bondi babe. Oh. I was born at War Memorial Hospital, which is... Waverley, but it's close enough to Bondi, and uh, went to the local schools. Yeah. Because no one went to private schools in those days unless you were mega, mega wealthy. Mm. And uh, we had a large percentage of girls who were Jewish in our high school, like more than one third, which is very unusual considering how small our community really is. Mm. But, um, and of course, they were all in the top classes, weren't they? Oh. <laughs> you know, we're not saying that, you know, we're different, but children get their brains from their mothers. Yes, I know that for sure. Yes. Thank you for endorsing that. <laughs> yeah. I hope no men are watching this. <laughs> they, they, might might get, they might get offended, but, it, but I've always said that's true. But uh, nevertheless, my kids got a bit of both of us. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see the differences of... Uh, marrying an English person and a Bondi babe, I had to teach him that life does exist during the day. Oh. Because when he was a teenager in London, it was only nightlife. Yeah, I can relate. Yep. That's right. So the first thing I had to do was tell him, you can't sleep in on a Sunday morning if we've been out on a Saturday <laughs> night and, and everybody's down at the beach on the steps at Bondi, making the arrangements. Steps, That's right, yeah. making arrangements for the rest of the day and even for the rest of the week if it was Christmas time. Because <laughs> you had the uh, Maccabi games, so all the Melbourne kids, if it, if it was in Sydney, were all on the steps and that's where everybody met from interstate as ah. well. So, you know, it, it. You must have had an amazing social life. Oh, it was great. <laughs> I walked to the beach because I lived close enough. And never took any money because there was always someone there to buy you a drink. And then you'd come home and you knew exactly what you were doing for the, that evening. You always had it all lined up and your parents would say, and where are you going tonight? <laughs> and of You're course, not going out in that. <laughs> that hey, Did they say, say that? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> I, you know, you had to be ultra conservative. No makeup was allowed. So 
the girls all used to have their makeup hidden in their purses and you dash into the ladies room put your makeup on then go out and meet all the guys and then you'd go back and wash your face off before your parents collected you <laughs> and of course you had to be collected and dropped off and collected and um, that's how I met Ken was a friend father was the youth counsellor for Central Synagogue and he was forming a new youth group in uh, Bondi Junction for 16 to 21 year olds. Well I wasn't 16 but I could pretend I was. Well, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was on the original committee and that's where I met this person who walks in very self-confident in clothing that is not available in Sydney that he bought in London before he came to Australia. And he'd only been in the country less than six months when I met him. So he's had a definite Northwest London accent. Good evening, my name is Ken Gresham. I'm your new president. <laughs> we hadn't even elected him yet. <laughs> so it nothing was- Nothing much has changed No, there. no, nothing much changed. So it, it's, it's interesting because the first thing we did within a month of forming the uh, committee, they had a, a, a door knock appeal on Sunday morning for the Red Cross. And this was the very first time they'd ever done this door knock appeal where it was one particular day, everybody would volunteer mm. to go and collect the money. And of course, being the youth group, we, we automatically volunteered ourselves and we also did blue box collecting. Mm. So that's how okay. we start. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And uh, some of the people we met were in a, a youth group called Blue and White. I never heard of them. Well, it, I didn't mix with them because they were a little bit older, but I met a few of them once. We were an item mm -hmm. because we were saving to get married. So you would find all sorts of weird ways to do things that didn't cost any money. So we had one young couple who had just got married so we'd visit them once a week for a cup of coffee because that didn't cost anything. That's free. <laughs> yeah. And then we joined all the other youth groups yeah. that we could possibly join because we would work for the functions and not have to pay to go in. You've got it down pat. That's yes. amazing. And we had uh, a drama festival that was run through all the different youth groups and all sorts of activities that the kids would never let you do today. Mm. They, they just don't want to be organised. They don't want to be part of yeah. anything. It's very, very different it today. Is different. Well, but, that's, uh, yeah, that's another part of the question I was going to ask you later. Um, what, your parents were my, both... My parents were both born in Brisbane, but met and married at the Great Synagogue oh. in Sydney. So I got married at the Great, and my daughter got married at the Great, so we've got three generations oh, wow. now. That's lovely. Yeah. So when you were growing up, you went to a secular school at yeah, I went, to, I went to what, to what is called the brothel on the hill. Oh, Dover Heights. <laughs> you see, you Dover know. Heights. No, I was supposed to go to Sydney High. I passed the entrance exam and there was only three of the girls in my class allowed to go and I refused to go to right. Sydney High because we lived at the bottom of Hardy Street, mm -hmm. which is a walk to the school. And also my father would have driven me to school every morning which is just a little bit too full on. And then I would have had to catch a bus mm -hmm. home with the other girl who lived in the next street to me, who was also accepted for Sydney High, and we hated each other. Oh. So <laughs> there was no way I was going to go to Sydney High. So I went to Dover Heights instead. And then I had an argument with my French teacher in the third year of high school. And she said, it doesn't matter what mark you get in your French. I have the opportunity uh, to refuse you permission to do French for your matriculation. Now, I didn't know she couldn't do that. <laughs> I didn't know she wasn't even staying at the school next year. So she she knew, but she, but she just did not. We really didn't get on. And uh, I just, you know how you say things without thinking? Well, I'm very impromptu. <laughs> I can't imagine. No, 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 no. I always say the wrong thing at the wrong time. And this particular time, I really did say the wrong thing because I turned around and I said, well, Miss O'Brien, it doesn't matter. I'm not staying at school. And I literally walked home from school that day with autographs all over my uniform. <laughs> totally unexpected. Never occurred to me. But once I'd said it, I didn't know how 
to, to go, go back. back. <laughs> and my mother was the only time in her life she was totally lost for words. Right. This is the girl who was in the top 20 of the school every year in her exams, in the top class, was going to go and demonstrate and go to uni and do all those things. Oops. Oops is right. And my mum said, can't do that. You must have a career. You must be able to financially support yourself. And I said, well, I'm working Saturday mornings in a hairdressing salon, earning a bit of pocket money, and they need an apprentice. So just ring her up and tell her I'll take the job. So that's how I started in hairdressing. Right. So that probably leads me to another question, which is, like, if you can have seven careers in a lifetime, how many do you think you've had? Hairdressing, uh, property management, strata management, uh, retail sales, uh, managing a hairdressing salon. This is all totally unqualified. And then I learned how to be a podiatrist. So I've almost got seven. Almost seven. Almost seven. Still not yeah. too late, yeah. though. But you see, and volunteer, of course. Yeah, of course. Well, the volunteering is always in the... Oh, no, my seventh job was a grandmother. I officially okay. retired from work when number one grandson was born. And I was just turned 51. And my daughter, in those days, there was no maternity leave. And she didn't have any annual leave yeah. either. Yeah. So I said, don't worry. She got permission to work from home for the first 12 months. So every morning I had to be at the house <laughs> before nine and Jonathan and I would leave the house because he never slept in the cot during the day. He only slept in the stroller. So he was very, very fit, very fit. And, uh, we, and I looked after him full time until he started at uh, preschool. And then I shared the collecting of him between Daddy mm. and me who was doing ship work. And Ailey went back to work full time in the office after the first okay. 12 months. So, oh. and then of course, every subsequent child, you take on the same responsibility oh. as well. I hope you got paid. That would have been your seventh grade. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I can include lots of volunteer work yeah. that doesn't get paid. Absolutely. So tell me a bit more about the volunteer work that you've done. Because you started quite young doing it. Yes. You said so, you did the yeah. blue boxes. The blue boxes. The 15 well, or something. Yes. From 15 onwards, we, um, because we were the, the youth group from Central Shore, we were given Bondi Junction, but we were given areas that nobody else wanted to go to. And there was a boarding house in Grafton Street, Bondi Junction. Mm -hmm. I believe it's still a boarding house and it's still there, but it was full of Holocaust survivors or gentlemen who didn't want to speak English anymore, except for one. My great uncle Paul, thank God, was there. Because we turn up and they, I mean, these are all men who have no money and all they have is the pension, but they had their own blue box, every single man, and every single man gave more in proportion to what he was worth than anybody else because that's wow. the way they felt. Mm. And Uncle Paul used to translate for me because they're all chatting away in Yiddish and I don't understand Yiddish. I'm Australian. What would I know about Yiddish? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was... We've got all the lousy jobs. So then when we got married, I was promoted. <laughs> I was given uh, Isabel Avenue, which we called Little Israel. There were so many Jewish people in Isabel Avenue that we had, if people would remember, there was a book and it had slips in it that you'd write the receipt. Oh, I remember those. Yes. You'd tear off the That's car. right. And it, it's, it's, it's like a Kalamazoo type system. Yeah. We had two books because there were too many people in Isabel Avenue. We didn't do Diamond Bay Road. Well, we didn't need to do Diamond Road. We just did Isabel Avenue. Mm. Gosh. And it was amazing because they were all brand new units on one side. And this is before the townhouses were built even. Mm. It was still a dairy. But Ken and I never kept kosher. But it was interesting because amongst our friends, most of us came from non-religious homes but most of them became religious. Must have been pressure. Been no, pressure. no, it was a cho <laughs> it was a choice. They actually chose yeah. to become Shomrei Shabbat, which was uh, it was interesting to watch it because some of them stayed that way. Mm. Some people I know who come from kosher homes have not kept it. So it's a, it's a real con you can't explain why some do and some don't. No formula. No, no. So from the J&F, as soon as I was married, I uh, wanted to join Wheatsoft. 
and, uh, and there was new groups being formed by WITSO mm. and the, the group I joined was mothers of uh, Mariah Kindergartens from Glenair Avenue and Mount Zion in Bondi Road. So they had a list of all the mothers' names mm. and phone numbers. Yeah, yeah. And the first meeting I went to, they're going through the list and they said, oh, does anybody know this Sarah Gresham? And I said, Sarah? <laughs> As usual, everybody always calls me by the wrong name. Do they? I yeah. would never do that. Oh, you're so wonderful. <laughs> but, uh, no, and so I said, that's me. Oh, good, we can cross you off the list then. And they were just ringing all the... And we all had a child, whether it be the first, second or third. Yeah. But we all had a child at the kindergarten at that time. So we had something in common. Is that why you joined it? Like, what, no, what was no, the purpose? I, I wanted to join Weed So because I wanted to... Uh, look after children. I thought that, you know, I mean, if WITSO is still the largest charity in Israel. Mm -mm. It looks after 25% of the population. That's huge. I, I know. They do an amazing job. Yeah, and it always has been. I mean, Israel, to grow, has to keep the wages low, mm. which means that you do have a poverty level problem. And it it's something that I just felt how lucky we were in Australia mm. and I had wanted to go on Aliyah until I had a book. <laughs> I will admit I'm, I'm, I'm a Zionist who changed her mind when she saw this little baby and said he's not a soldier. Uh. When I finally got to Israel for the first time ever, it was 1981, I never oh. felt so embarrassed when I saw all these boys. Mm. We're down at a museum in Tel Aviv, so I don't even know the name of the museum, and the boys were in their first year of national service and they piled all their rifles up like a teepee mm. in the middle of the ground and then were sitting down chatting and going into the museum. And I looked at them all. None of them had any facial hair. <laughs> you know, yeah, they're all still... young. And I thought, what's different about them to my son? Nothing. Mm -hmm. How dare I yeah. be so selfish? So what I decided was I'd have to work hard for weeks uh. to make up for it. <laughs> So how long have you been with Weed Science? Since 1971. Wow. So what what have you been doing and how, how has that I changed? Have been, I have been years? the treasurer uh, and the president of my group and our group then merged with a few others. Uh, and I have been the treasurer for yonks. But now you don't... I mean, nowadays, with the restructuring of charities as a whole, it's not the same... You have these titles and you don't have anything to do. It's very discouraging. I mean, I used to actually have to collect the money, bank it, do a reconciliation every month, have a bank statement that I had to take into the WITSO office. And and they were very pleased that there were some people like me who knew what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. And all the other groups had to give up having their own bank accounts. Ours was the last group. Because <laughs> I, was, I was very... Do I really want to give it up, you know? And they said, I'm sorry, you just have to. <laughs> because the bank started charging yeah. account keeping fees and everything else, which is very hard. And also, they'd have to ring me and ask me to come in and pay my money over. Mm. Because I'd wait till it was a certain amount. Mm. And if you were having a competition against the different groups who'd raised the most money for that cycle, you'd hold the money back. So <laughs> no one knew how much you were handing in. Oh, can imagine you. Totally can imagine you. <laughs> yes, so you understand. So I, but to me, the whole point is you enjoy the charity work. It is fun. And if you are raising money for a specific cause, all the better. Mm. But you don't do it to... It's not... Um, I mean, people used to joke and call the UIA an insurance policy. Give the money instead of going, instead of doing something. I always thought it was exactly the opposite. I enjoyed doing something to raise the money. Mm. So it's a different yeah. mindset, totally different. So what were you the most proud of in that whole, in your whole week so experience? Um, well, a few years ago, they uh, had a, a major appeal to rebuild the uh, boarding school in Haifa. Do you know anything about yes, that? Yes, I think oh, I was at that. Gym. Yeah. And um, it coincided with a few of the girls losing their parents. So our group, as a whole, gave a large amount of money. And you, uh, 
if you raised, if you gave a certain amount, you were allowed to have a room. Mm. So my father was bipolar. So I said, I want that psychiatry room. <laughs> and Ken said, yeah, she needs to go in it. <laughs> so we were very proud as a group because we were, we were more, we weren't just uh, good at fundraising, we were also committed mm. and enjoyed what we are doing. Mm -hmm. Like last week, the Melbourne Cup, COVID-19, you can't have a big function. So we had a function in three different homes. Nice. And everybody enjoyed it. There was a maximum of 20 people in each home, mm -hmm. but everybody enjoyed it. And maybe that's what we should do with the shul. I don't know. There are ways of, and means of, of still being sociable mm -hmm. and not just through Zoom. Absolutely. There's no reason why not. You might have to lead that committee. I might have to, night and day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind. I am, I am free now. Cool. As free as a bird, aren't I? Yeah. I'm sure we can put you to some good use with all of this charitable work that you've got experience yeah. in. It's yeah. fantastic. So, so then when, um, when I was working full time, I used to have two and three different jobs, as well as doing hairdressing at home for people. And this new industry started, or well, new charity, Meals on Wheels. Mm. And I thought, wow, that's very interesting. My grandmother had passed away, my mother-in-law had passed away, and I didn't have anybody of that generation. Oh, to be in contact with. And I thought, that's what I need. And, but I wasn't able to do that until... Um, after my parents died and I had one day a week free from work. So I started delivering kosher meals on wheels and I started that in 1990. Oh, wow. So what would you do? Was that preparing the food? No, no, no. we don't prepare. Well, the very, when I first started, Judith and Malcolm Lewis made course, the food yeah. and we all used to meet on a Friday morning. There'd be about 20 volunteers and we'd all sit there and chat while they were finishing off cooking, packing, and putting it in bags so we'd deliver food Hot. that wasn't even cooled down yet. Really? But um, Mrs. Grunfeld came and undercut Malcolm and Judith mm. with a price. Yeah. And do you know what they, Malcolm and Judith said to me afterwards? Or I think a couple of weeks after they'd lost it. He said, do you know, they're better off. <laughs> I didn't realise how much it was actually costing us to give this <laughs> service. And I said, ah, <laughs> because they never put their prices up. Okay. You know, and... The cost of doing things like this, oh, it's very labour intensive. I'm That's sure right. for not a very many. How many how many meals would have been delivered? 20, oh, oh no, 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 no. In 1990, we had we would deliver to about between 10 and 15 people per person. Right. And it depended on whether they were individuals or couples. How many meals you were delivering? Right. And you would deliver Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. Then Monday, you'd deliver two meals. And then on Wednesday, you deliver another two meals. But also, the interesting thing is, if you look at the menu, it's different meals for different days. And if you want to have something on another day, you don't have to have it delivered on that day. No. You can ask them to store it, and they've got a really cold, cold store, or freezer, mm -hmm. and they deliver once a week to the North Shore now, and they will deliver, but they will deliver a whole week's supply. So it's been in the oh freezer yeah, yeah. For, the, for people. because That's amazing. It, yeah, but the number of meals that we're delivering. Because there never used to be any takeaway. There's no, now kosher, true. There's now kosher takeaway. There's uh, meals that you can buy in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. You can buy vegetarian meals in the supermarket if you, if you keep kosher. Yeah. So there is a much more variety. Yeah, for sure. But, oh, wow. when, but when we first started, it was also set up because there were a lot of people who were on their own. Mm. And the only person they saw was the deliverer. Yeah. And so it, did you spend much time chatting with people? Yes. So but it must have taken you a yeah. whole day to deliver all of that I stuff. used to start at a quarter to nine and I had King's Cross one particular on a Friday morning and I would finish about one o'clock, usually with one parking ticket. Oh, oh. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, we, I was allowed to do that. Ken said it was okay. Oh, okay. So yeah. did that give you a lot of joy? Like which bit yes, of it gave it, you it a lot of joy? Yes, it helped me because I did that very shortly after my parents. See, my parents died within less than two months apart. Oh, God. Right? And they were only 71 when they died. So I 
was totally lost. And I discovered that that helped me. There was one particular lady who loved me to come mm. and she used to have the coffee pot on for me. This is where I got the parking ticket. She, took, she was a Holocaust survivor with no children wow. and her husband had only died four months earlier. Mm. She used to wait for me to come and we'd talk about, he was a sculptor as a hobby and she had all these beautiful little sculptures all around the, the flat and we'd talk about a different sculpture every week. And it helped her and she was so, you know, she said, it is so wonderful to have someone. Yeah, so and I said, teacher. no, no, no. I said, you're helping me as well. Yeah. And it, it really did. It, it, today, it's not the same. No. Well, it's... I don't know why. Well, um, I've got two people that I deliver to every Monday, regular as clockwork. One of them has been on the list um, on and off for the last 15 years, to my knowledge, because I've been delivering in that area. I have never met the people. It's in a duplex and they have a lift. Oh, and so you, you park the, the car undercover, you get out, you press the buzzer, she calls the lift down, oh. you put the food in the lift so she opens the security door and you put the food in the lift, then you close the security door and say bye bye and go and there's another guy in Elizabeth Bay who's exactly the same. I mean, I don't put it in the lift, I put it next to the lift for him, but inside. Wow. And I talked to him through the intercom. <laughs> Turns out he, he is um, a Bondi boy like me. He used to live in Nancy Street, North Bondi. I won't mention his surname in case people know because a relative of his was um, <clears throat> insulted by Rabbi Apple. Uh, <laughs> from the Bimmer, no, well, <laughs> there was a family who was members of the Shaw who had some very devious... <laughs> Occupation. Okay, this okay. is all recorded. <laughs> yeah, so so basically, I, I'm sitting there and I said, are you any relation to this particular person? He says, yeah, he said, it's my uncle. I said, oh, I said, I went to school with your sister. You lived in Nancy Street. He said, that's me. <laughs> so you've got to be careful what to say. You do. Yeah, <laughs> so such a small world. But I've never met him. We just chat through the intercom. It's scary. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You think I'm, people want to have some human contact. That's right. I like the face-to-face, -face, yeah. and I can't believe that people are like that. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the other lady in the Emmanuel Gardens building. I deliver to her on a Monday. I sometimes meet the non-kosher food being delivered at exactly the same time. How can she eat so much? I don't know. <laughs> I'm delivering a multitude of meals or a multitude of soups only, she decides. And then and this girl, we're both walking down the corridor, and I said, you're going to Jerry. And she said, yes, am I doing the wrong thing? I said, no, she's ordered from both of us. <laughs> so, you know, it's the best of, of both worlds. Yeah. Is that all you do for COA, or do you uh, hang yeah, out? Yeah, I used to do uh, the sandwiches, the soups. <laughs> yeah. And I was there, and the shopping for, the, for all the in-house meals. Luckily, I don't have to do that anymore. But oh. we'll talk about that in the last segment of the oh, question. Yes. Because there is a reason why I don't do it anymore. Okay. So I had one question was, could you give me one story from the salon chair? From the salon chair. Um, the one about the lady who'd go in the front door and go out the back door, come back in the back door two hours later and out the front door. Oh, at your salon? Yes. I was so naive. Did she get her hair done? Oh, yeah, she got her <laughs> hair done. She got her hair done first, and then she'd sneak out the back door. And I was so naive, I didn't understand. By the time I was engaged, I was allowed to be told, and I wasn't sent to the milk bar next door to count the lollies in the jar. <laughs> Turns out, in those days, you had to be photographed with your part boyfriend to get a divorce. Oh, so she was being followed because her husband knew she was being unfaithful, oh, but she didn't want to get caught. So she spent a couple of hours in the salon. That's right. Right. So, but you I'm so naive. had all the secrets. Yeah. And then, of course, there was the other ladies who used to talk about the uh, doctors in Elizabeth Street, probably in the building where um, the rabbi and Hinda lived until they'd just moved. Yeah. But in that... that Oh, it was an old building, and there were qu fully qualified doctors who used to do terminations <gasps> when it wasn't legal. But they had a house, so I found out, they had a house set up in Avoca Street, Rangley. The house doesn't exist anymore, it's a block of units as well. 
but it was a huge old house because there were some big old houses in Ramwick. Yes. With operating theatres properly set up and camp beds in the other rooms where you recovered from. And I'm, I'm asking these questions of the ladies and she said, we have yet, two of them had been, they're Catholic. They couldn't take precautions, oh. but they didn't want any more children. Oh. And they said that they knew it was clean, it was not dangerous, it was properly done. And they had been more than once. It was 50 pounds. Oh, that's a lot. I was earning uh, five pounds a week wow. as an apprentice yeah. at the time. And they said they'd never, ever, ever seen a single girl. They were all married women who accidentally, because oh there was God. no pill yet, yeah. who accidentally fell pregnant. And and that that was the discussion, that because I was in, interested in politics as yes. well. So that was the question. Do you think that, you know, termination should be legalised? Yes, because we'd never met a single girl. It's all been us married women. It does happen, you know, you do fall <gasps> pregnant accidentally. Yeah. And it was quite... It was quite good. I had another client who used to talk about the third eye <laughs> with the Dalai Lama. And there was a book that was published about that time. <laughs> but it was stuff. <laughs> yeah, but, but she used to talk to me. And so every client had a different yeah. subject. That was I it like being to. a therapist, do you yeah. think? Because yeah. people go to their hairdresser to offload, don't they? Yes, but if you really want the best one, it's my grandmother. My mother's mother told me that you sit on a bus stop. This is long before psychologists or psychiatrists were re readily available. You sit on a bus stop and you sit next to a complete stranger and you tell the stranger everything and you know that it's not going to go anywhere because they don't know who you are, but you've got it off your chest. Yeah. Well, they probably think you're a complete psycho. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she said that and she also, my grandmother also believed you don't get into a quiet street. You are in a busy street where you can stand up front. There's oh, always I see. people coming I and see. going. I see, I see. And actually, that's very relevant because in the little street that I live in now, there's one elderly lady who lives two doors away, and we all keep an eye out for uh, her. All the other elderly people are all passed away in the last yeah. seven or eight years. But it does go in cycles. We've now got little kids. So I'm going to be the old lady in the street show. Hopefully they'll be taking, <laughs> yeah. taking care of you yeah. and keeping an eye on you. That's right. And I found out this lady... bring you meals on wheels if you're lucky. <laughs> this lady, her daughter and granddaughter live just around the corner, one street away. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I need to do is get their house number so I can put a note in their letterbox if I'm worried. But she now has a carer, comes three days a week. Oh. And... So, you know, everybody feels much happier that way okay. because they know what's going on so in the street. Taking care of everyone. But that's a little tiny street, you see, mm. and the houses are all close together mm -hmm. and you've got a mixture of home and work. Yep. Yep. And it's not like here. You, you no, could, you people, could go know, forever I'm, and you'd never speak I to I never get to see my neighbours. I don't even know who they are. No, that's right. So I have my last question. Yes. So this is, how do you think communal work and the community has changed, say, in the last 40 years? Well, you might want to edit this afterwards, but <laughs> I'll tell you personally what I think. I believe that the government is giving too much to charities. Um, they're taking over too much of our enthusiasm and our want to help the community. And I think that there are two future careers health and charity and the reason why I don't make sandwiches don't do the shopping uh, and don't do make soups and things because they employ people in the COA whereas it was 100 there was maybe two or three mm. paid employees only yeah. and the rest of us were all volunteers mm. and it's not like that anymore in yeah. any it's not just the COA I'm using the COA as a perfect example but that's how it is nowadays that uh, well women are working there's more women in the workforce than there used to be I think but I as worked well. as well but I found time yeah we well yeah we this is this but you see also when out. I was young we would not go out as a group of girls for a meal and leave our husbands with the children at home the only way we got out was to go to Wheatso. that's why our Wheatso group was so successful we had a meeting every month <laughs> without fail 
every month. And our husbands knew that was the night they had to stay at home with the children. And that night we were allowed out. We had so a guest. We didn't go out the back door for two hours. No, <laughs> that's right. And and we had um, we never had alcohol because that's just not in our makeup. We had a guest speaker one night. We used to have sometimes have guest speakers, sometimes not. And we had this guest speaker and she asked for a glass of whiskey. And we just looked at her quite blankly. And we said, we don't drink any alcohol. What? <laughs> you have a meeting and there's no alcohol? <laughs> and as my daughter says, nobody is like that today. No. Everyone it's very, needs alcohol. <laughs> that's right. It's very, very different. But it's not what it used to be. The young ones don't want to belong. They don't want to... Um, they would rather give the money than volunteer as well, mm. whereas we did both. We found a way of having fun and giving the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, can you see any positives? No. Nope. Any good things come nope. out of no nope. community? Are they nope. donating more money? No. Nope. No, nope. they're not donating more money because the government is giving more money. It's not required. You know, there used to be a thing called the Royal Blind Society. There used to be mm. a blind, deaf and dumb or, or mm. deaf society. None of those societies exist anymore because they are totally covered by NDIS. Right. Okay. No need for money. No need for volunteers. No need for donations. Gosh. So they have it's effect. Tragic, isn't yes, it? they have effect. It's gone the wrong way. But that's just my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. And you're entitled to it. I'm just disappointed. Yeah, well, it's the next generation of givers. There's, there's yes, but if you look void. at the, if you look at the people who are on the board of, say, the COA, for example. Now we're a seniors organisation, but I was uh, on the board from the age of forty-four. Mm. I, they told me I couldn't officially be on the board. I had to be fifty-five. Do you know what the average age is on the board now? 75 or over. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, so it's, it's got worse because there is no one to take their places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what's it's true. That's what's it's not relevant. Be. It's not relevant to younger people. Whereas it was to be. Yeah. What happened to the generational thing? Yeah, Don't the no. kids have any relationship with their grandparents? They're too busy, aren't they, kids? Tell me, I meant to ask, your involvement in the Willara... Yeah, Queen Street and West Willara Association. It is the longest running uh, communal, uh, local community organisation. Mm. And uh, Ken was president for about... Well, he was president for about eight or nine years. He got a bit thin. So he found a guy to take his place. Only he died six months later oh, in the job. Planning. So Ken ended up back as president. Do you know, because of COVID-19, they haven't replaced Ken. Oh. Wow. So I don't know whether it's Jonas and whether nobody wants the job because they die in office. <laughs> <laughs> so did you, but he was doing work for the Willara Sailing Club? Uh, no, Royal Motor Yacht Club. Royal Motor Yacht Club. Yeah. What yeah. was he doing for that? Okay, he was on the board of the Royal Motor Yacht Club. He was a treasurer for quite a few years. He took over the treasurer position when they were really, really having difficulty, like with the 1990s recession, mm -hmm. the recession we had to have, mm -hmm. and they restructured the whole club, and then they rebuilt a lot of the premises in, in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. So he was there for all of that, and then uh, organising a proper mortgage for the club, because not everybody knew how to speak to the bank. Mm -hmm. You've got to have business people. Yes, you do. You do. Because they are more knowledgeable. They know how to speak to the different people mm. and uh, they had the same problem there as you have at the great. <laughs> they, uh, Ken made made a rule that there had to be women on the board of the Royal Motor Yacht Club but as soon as he resigned there's no more women. Uh, well, we're, we're working more. <laughs> I think you on the board at the shawl as well. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we've got another female on the board. We have three. Oh, I'm off. We've got two. Two. Yeah, so two. so so we have someone to bad. replace you. That's right. Mm -hmm. I think the only problem was that when Ross was president, there were things that, as a woman, she couldn't do. Yeah. And that was the only problem. And we really can't have a female president. I understand. I'm not oh, going to push the could. envelope that far. <laughs> yeah. I did get a few people saying that.
that I should have been, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But you it's can't, hard, you it's can't, hard. you can't stand up and no. and, and and do and take part in yeah. the service. So yeah. it's very difficult. Yeah. But uh, and also, you know, it depends on the rabbi how women work with the board yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. We're very and, lucky and, now. Yeah, and and Ben, I think, it, it mm. is great. He's definitely used to women. Yes. Yes. So what do you get from coming to Shaw? It's a very interesting question. My daughter doesn't understand it. She doesn't like going to Shaw. I love it. I don't think I've actually met her. No, that's right. <laughs> that's right. She used to go to Shaw every Yom Tovim because she had to when she was little. And she and I had two seats up at the very back of the wall where there's a heap, where there's yeah, no yeah. seat now yeah, where yeah. it juts out. And they were the cheapest seats because that's all we could afford. And we had two seats for Simon and Ken on the back wall so we could see each other. Simon played cards under the <laughs> door with, uh, oh, I won't say who, because no. um, his parents might still be members of the show. I'm not sure whether they are or not. I'm sure he won't be punished now. No, but um, Simon was, the funny thing is, the two of them know a lot because we sent them to Mariah. I sent them to Mariah because I'm not knowledgeable. I come from a background where my father was so anti-religion, I didn't learn much. Mm. And I'd never learnt to read Hebrew because I wasn't allowed to go to Haida. So what I insisted upon was the kids going to Haida and going to Mariah as soon as we could afford it mm. because they had to learn what I couldn't teach them because they don't have enough knowledge to choose. Yeah. And I still believe that we won't lose them totally if they have a good background yeah, in, in mind. Sure. You know? mm -hmm. And the latest is my brother, who's much more religious than me, thinks that Mariah is not religious enough. And I said to him, <clears throat> your grandchildren do not have to go to Mariah. You and your daughter and son-in-law and your wife are all Shomre Shabbat. So they are living the whole lifestyle. Mm. They don't need to have it any extra. Yeah. yeah. He, my brother doesn't see it that way. It's really interesting. It is interesting. Two yeah. people brought up in the same house as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we, we both come from an irreligious... He had his bar mitzvah at the Emmanuel Shul. He's tone deaf, so he said his parsha. He didn't sing it because he can't sing. Neither can I, but that's beside the point. <laughs> and... And he meets a girl whose whose parents were Holocaust survivors who kept a kosher home. Mm. And she said, I wish to keep a kosher home. And he said, well, if that's what you want, fine. And then slowly, 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 mm. her father oh. converted my brother into being more religious. Mm. And now he goes to shul every morning and every evening. Wow. And it, my father must be determined. <laughs> so why do you like going to the shul? It, it has a really nice feel and I sit there and I, I just feel good when I'm sitting in shul, mm. except for one song, which I know Ken loved, it upsets me every time. But, but they sang Adana Lama to the wrong tune on Saturday. That was I, an interesting one. That was yes, quite, but no. That has, was has to, has, no, it has to be the right <laughs> one because that I used to go to shul at the old central and sit with my cousin, who's always been Shomer Shabbat. But I only used to do it for four or five weeks of the year when I wasn't working in the salon. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed it because Anne and I used to sit and yak, 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 of course. But I knew all the tunes. I didn't realise how much of the service you actually do absorb. Yeah, absolutely. You get I mean, used to those yeah, tunes. I don't look at the sedil. I don't look to see what the prayers are in English because... It, that's not what I'm there for. Yeah. I'm there for, I suppose, just for a bit of calm and peace. Mm -hmm. And obviously to say hello to people. Of course. You've got some friends yes. that you grew up with there, probably. Well, there's quite a few of them that are no longer members of the shore, which I find really sad. But what they do is they move to another shore because their children yeah. have chosen yeah. a different shore, yeah. which is really hard. I don't know how we get the younger ones back because that's how... We're going to keep the shoe growing. Job you've, you've got so many jobs you've got mm -hmm. to do. 
No, no. But all this time on I, your hands. Yes, I know. I'm just <laughs> going to have to put my thinking cap on and come up with some brilliant, brilliant ideas. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say how lovely it was talking to you today. Yes, and, and I don't know whether grateful. I've given you anything entertaining, but you can you can you edit have, it. You have. You have. You've. You've. Give us an, an insight into your life and what it was like growing up here. That's what I really wanted to find out. What life was like for you growing up and what drew we'll tell you back one, to the community. Yeah, I will tell you one thing that you can't do today. That uh, When I was uh, 13, 14, first of all, there was a dance every Saturday night at, at a shore, somewhere to go. Mm. I was not allowed to go out with a non-Jewish boy under any circumstances. Then my first boyfriend was Jewish, but my mother didn't like him. So I used to tell her that I was going out with meeting someone else and meeting at the corner of the street. You're naughty. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it here, and then Do if anybody think, yeah, wants yeah. to ask any questions, then they're most welcome to. <laughs> so that was Sarah, Sarah's story. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I, it was quite a trip down memory lane. And for me, it was quite interesting to have that social history, which I wasn't around for. Did anyone else have um, any questions or any comments or observations of their experiences of working in the community or growing up in Sydney? They wanted to contribute. I agree with Sarah that the community has changed exactly as she said, and that's what upsets me. But then, you know, there's that fine line between somebody's job and a volunteer who could afford to volunteer, and then they consider they may be taking somebody's job. I don't know what the answer is, but that seems to be the problem today, whereas people were happy to volunteer. Women weren't expected to work. Only the poor people worked in my day. Mm. My mother-in-law used to say, oh, the, the cleaner's a woman, but that's it. The people who can afford to stay at home did the charity. Now, I think having women's lib has had a two-edged sword on life. I think the community has left and uh, we're all doing our own thing. Maybe it's better, I don't know. Anyway. I agree with Sarah. That's exactly what I thought was wrong with the community today. There we are. Thank you, Anna. Does anyone else have anything they wanted to add? No? Oh, Shelley, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, Sarah, that you? was fantastic. It was very enlightening. I also understand a lot about how you enjoyed all your volunteering. Because over the years, when, even when our children were both in preschool, I used to volunteer, help with fundraising, and don't listen to that, Caroline, and uh, do a lot of <laughs> and do a, and do a lot of things in the local community. Um, and I can remember many, many years ago when I first met you. You may not remember this. I know you used to sit in the back row in shul. I used to sit in, a, in also in the back row beside you and there was another lady with her mother and with her daughter. And if, if I'm correct, the little girl's name was Rachel, but she has well and truly grown up and has a family now. Rachel but, was part of the Monday morning cooking club. Oh, for goodness sake. Well, anyway, um, I can remember we all used to sit along in that back row. Yes, and because Rachel, we, Rachel used to squash us all in because there was more people than seats. That's correct. And I used to have my two girls with me as well. She Esther was, Alec was the secretary then at Shaw and she used to, she yeah. gave me an extra couple of seats. So, uh, Do you remember the uh, the Polish Holocaust survivor, Tola Fisher, who used to sit next to me? She mm. had two sons and she was the only person I ever met in the Great Synagogue that had a history of being a Holocaust survivor. I don't know why she joined the Great Synagogue. No, I don't. I yeah. don't. She, by fluke, she ended up living, well, I ended up living next door to her. Okay. So uh, it, she, she was very interesting because she was the only one. All the rest of us were Australian or mm -hmm. English. Of, right. You know, of parents and grandparents. 
there. And if and if I may say so, you're, we're talking about Rachel. If I'm correct, her her grandmother every year for a number of years always used to wear a, a lovely blue coat. That's you, right. I don't know if you remember that. They moved to a row in front. They became wealthier than us. They moved further forward. There you go. <laughs> but no, to, Sarah, tonight has been, it's been lovely. I've thoroughly enjoyed tonight. Thank and you. hope to see you all and get in shul very soon. We hope to be coming back very soon. Oh, I hope so, Shelley. We hope so too. Thank you. And Joe, give our best to him. I will. I will. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, Sarah, you were brave. <laughs> she was so brave. She was sitting here saying, I can't believe you got me so relaxed. I didn't stop talking. How did you do that? I know. I didn't I even know. give her any wine for that situation. For that I okay, just wine. ask how much wine you gave her. I didn't give her any wine. No, none. Only tonight. Only tonight. tonight. I, I needed tonight to be I've calm got. tonight. So I Jewish to girls don't drink, remember what you just said? That's right. My Well, my daughter-in-law, who is not Jewish, introduced me to wine. Really? <laughs> yes, it's true. Is that like I want to go to Miami or proper no, no. red wine? She, <laughs> she used to say, let's have some wine. So I'd go out shopping and buy the wine and she'd drink it. And I think, this is ridiculous. Why aren't I sharing it with her? <laughs> so it just shows you, you see, change. Yeah. 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 It's true. Well, this has just been so lovely, Sarah. Thank you so, so much. And we... We're going to be getting you on board for volunteering for sure. Yeah, most, yeah, She's I joining our committee. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm available. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I can't sit at home and do nothing. No. And we need to have you in shul more often so that you can oh, really? sit in the back row with Shelley. Oh, okay. Well, that means I have to walk more <laughs> earlier. Actually, so she's richer still... now because she's in the front row. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <She> got... <laughs> I'm three rows from the back. Okay, that's yeah. an improvement. Yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Anybody else have any any comments or questions? Great. Well, this was absolutely wonderful. Look forward to seeing you all again soon, hopefully in person. Leona, maybe you'll come up to Sydney now that the borders have opened. Well, we'll see what happens. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It remind me what your connection with the great was, Leona. Leon, it is. Yeah, Leon. Leon. Leon, that's all right. No, well, actually, I worked at the great synagogue. Um, I was very pregnant with, my, with our first um, daughter. That was 53 years ago. And I worked with um, Norm Goodman. And I was in charge of the register for births and deaths. And, uh, and, and uh, yes, so, uh, yes. Do you remember who did the printing of the Great Synagogue Journal? I remember it was a publishing company. It was called Lokshan Printing, L-O-X, uh, uh, and it was Ken. It was Ken, was it? And I actually do remember you yeah. from, from the Great Synagogue. And, uh, yeah. and my husband, Harry, was very involved. We were both very involved with the Great um, when our children were going through the Hader there and... Uh, and uh, very involved with the Kedushim and everything. So, uh, yes. No, and we also were in, uh, part of the, um, the first group of um, young marrieds at the Great Synagogue, uh, the young marrieds group. Well, I hate to tell you, but we, were, we regarded the young marrieds as very ultra-conservative. Oh, well, no, we were we... <laughs> no, 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 no. There were a whole group of us, the Stearns. Um, yes. uh, Pam. Yeah, Pamela, Pamela and Russell, uh, the Lewises, there are a whole group of us and uh, and um, Beth Berman um, that was and, uh, and yes, and Henry Rays, yes, right? Sonia, Sonia and Henry Rays, there are a whole group of us. And then, uh, no, we, we were very, very close and uh, and even to this day, there's still a little bit of contact. So um, we've been married 56 years. We, I grew up in Brisbane. And my husband was grew up at, at the Great Synagogue, and had, he had his bar mitzvah there under Rabbi Porish. So uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, it's um, and my my in laws, um, Irene and Walter Engel, they were very heavily involved with the Great Synagogue and were members for many many years. 
Oh, well, your only problem is that you now live in Melbourne. Oh no, it's not a problem. It's we, we've been here. We've been here over 30, 35 years, and uh, and we've lived in Brisbane. We've lived in Sydney as well, and uh, and both our daughters were born in Sydney. But they look. They, uh, one lives in Melbourne. One lives in Brisbane. It just shows you, doesn't it? I need it? to check whether you're related to me. How? Yeah, you were saying that your mum was an Engel. Yes. What was what was her first name? Alice. She was born in Vienna. Yes. Well, my husband was born in Vienna too. Right. Isn't that interesting? So we you have know to... Paul Engel. You know Paul and Eva Engel. Uh, well, that's apparently they were very distantly related to my father-in-law. Paul Engel. Paul Engel. Was... Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very <laughs> distantly related. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. So your it was through Harry. Harry. Yes. Walter, Walter Engel. Walter, Walter and Irene Engel, uh, my in-laws. Yeah, yeah. That up on the family tree. Yes, right. Okay. <laughs> Lovely to meet you too. Too. And you said you're friends with the Lewises. Which Lewises? Uh, the Judy, Judy Lewis, Judy. Yes, yes. Oh, Judy and Michael Lewis, and uh, yes, yeah. They're all and, with the young marriage Judy. group. Yes. No, we were all very closely knit, and uh, it was it was wonderful, and. Uh, and even to this day, well, we're still in contact with the Robinsons, and for instance, and uh, yeah. So, um, but uh, no, life in Melbourne is is wonderful. We actually, I go to, we go to um, Marriage Road School uh, that's in Brighton, East Brighton, and at one stage we did have a lady president, and she used to give out her little drosher from upstairs. She used to stand in the front row. So there, where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, and, there you are. Good now. luck That's to her. <laughs> you can see. Yeah. You've got to take over from the and you'd place. you'd win you'd win many people over. Yes, yeah, yeah. And and they had uh, she had many people listening to her as well. So uh, yeah, Lovely. yeah. Good luck to her. <laughs> <laughs> that was a few years ago. Yes. I think it's a wonderful idea to do. Yes. That. Yes. 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 Yeah. So there is women, uh, we've got a very young rabbi now, and uh, a Rabbi Sirkin, and uh, and um, he joined our shul um, almost two years ago, this uh, this coming year. And uh, and um, he he actually, go, over the um, COVID period, he's been doing cooking online, and uh, he's a great cook. And, uh, and so every Wednesday at 5.30, you know, you can tune into him and... Uh, and he, he does a, a variety of different things as well. Are you listening to this? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, no. So, yes, no, our attachment to the great. That's why I, I like to tune in and, and hear different things. And I loved working in the, in, in the office. And uh, um, on uh, Mondays, um, uh, Monday for lunch, we always had a feast for leftovers of from the Kiddushim, um, from uh, from from Shabbos, and I was quite heavily pregnant. And Norm Goodman used to say to me, "Sit down, you've got to eat. You've got to eat." <laughs> so uh, no, it was it was great. We we used to have a, quite a few laughs. And uh, did, it, did Esther work with you? Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, no. touch with Leon. Yeah, you can yeah, have a good yeah. dog. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> if if and when I come up to Sydney sometime, we should meet. And uh, yes, Norm Goodman was our caterer for our wedding. Yes, 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 yeah. That's right. He and his wife, they were wonderful people. Wonderful people. And uh, yes, yeah. Very strong English accent. Oh yes, oh yes, with a great sense of humour. And uh, yeah, yes, yeah. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. Sharon, yes, we are well, to have a good one. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sharon, tell tell us what's happening for the rest of the year to do with great women. What is there something else planned? Well, we have coming up on the is it the seventh? The seventh. The seventh of December, we have a, a Sephardi cooking demonstration. For Laura Glockman. Sorry. For Hanukkah. For Hanukkah, that, that's right. And then on the 16th, we have Abra coming back uh, to do Rosh Chodesh. Um, and we're really, really excited about that. 
Um, and that is what we have planned so far for this year. The committee is going to be meeting and we're going to be getting into gear for what we're doing next year. Um, I think it will be different to what we're doing this year as people can get out more and can get together more. Um, we're hoping to have more in-person things safely. Um, and uh, ho hopefully we'll, we'll have lots of ideas and uh, uh, I've got a couple of new people coming onto the committee and, and hopefully Sarah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We're waiting for you, Sarah. <laughs> we are, we are. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you.